Thanks a lot, uh, Tom, for having me here and for starting with uh, Hip and Rock'em. And thanks everyone for being here and, and listening. Um, so what I'm gonna be doing next uh, will be a quick uh, overview of what we can offer uh, from AMD in terms of tools um, for, for GPUs. And uh, the presentation will be around 30 slides. Uh, and even though it may sound rather short, uh, it's, the, it's the result of work from a lot of people. <laughs> uh, some of them are listed here, but many others have contributed from, from our larger team. So I just wanted to take a second and acknowledge them. Uh, okay, yeah, so uh, I am gonna be talking about tools. Uh, and before I do that, I would like to spend some time um, to mention actually um, a few resources that are available for you um, to, to install these tools, because sometimes some of them may not be uh, available uh, in, in your system. So uh, we have worked on developing this model installation uh, repo. Uh, that um, you can find on GitHub and it's public. Uh, and there you can find uh, two ways uh, to, to proceed, uh, which are uh, through a container or with a bare metal installation script that will actually go ahead and, and install the software uh, on, your, on your machine. And uh, the bare metal installation scripts can actually be tested before you deploy them as well with, uh, with a container. Yes, so uh, I should mention that uh, with the new release of Brockham uh, 6.2, uh, some of the tools that I'll be talking about, such as Omnitrace and Omniperf are actually included in the Brockham stack, uh, which means that you don't have to install them separately if you have installed Brockham 6.2. So uh, at the GitHub repo that I mentioned before, uh, you can, install different versions of, of Rockham. And if you choose to install 6.2, then you will find that um, uh, Omnitrace and Omniperf are already there. Uh, but if you proceed with the container, we will also install the ones uh, that are out of AMD research, uh, which are the, the original ones. So if you if you go through the container installation, you will find both the the uh, 6.2 versions that come with Rockham and also the ones from AMD Research, so you can play with both. Um, and also we have found, <laughs> uh, this is probably obvious, but <laughs> we have found that it's very important to actually test that the installation has gone through correctly and it's doing what you, you want it to do. So we uh, have a test suite at this other GitHub repo where you can basically run um, many scripts actually that will make sure that what you have installed can, um, can pass some sanity checks. Um, you can just either directly clone the, the repo and run the suite uh, by, by going inside the repo directory and then tests and then just do a dot slash run tests. Uh, or you can um, proceed with the modern installation um, technique that I showed, that I briefly mentioned before, uh, hop in a Docker container uh, by using a make file, use make file option, and then you can basically just make the number of, the name of the package that you're interested, uh, and then do a make uh, package underscore tests. Um, so I'm sorry if this is a lot of information only in three slides, but hopefully uh, the readme's at the model installation repo will, will clarify any doubt. Okay, so um, this is pretty much the outline of what I wanted to go over today. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on number one since uh, Tom has already done a great job uh, mentioning those. Uh, but then the idea of this talk is basically to start with an example and then use that same example progressively uh, to explore what these tools can do for you uh, in an incremental way. So the example I'm going to consider is this uh, MPI Ghost Exchange example that's actually available at the same repo where you have the test suite uh, to verify the installation. And this uh, example was written by uh, Bob Roby 
and uh, his um, co-author. Uh, and this is available in, in the book that they have published here. It's referenced at the bottom. Um, so this, this example here serves as um, basically a simplified uh, example of what an, an actual real uh, scientific application could be. Uh, and basically we have a rectangular domain that partitioned with a, a two-dimensional computational grid uh, that's partitioned among MPI processes. And the solution is defined uh, on a cell-wise basis and it's, in, it's initialized in some way. And then it's advanced using uh, a kernel that's basically doing a five-point average of the value of the solution at the uh, neighboring cells. And when we're running in parallel with, with MPI, there's also uh, ghost cells, sorry, ghost cells, uh, which refer to cells that uh, are needed for the computation by one of the processes, but they are actually owned by, by the neighbor. Um, okay, yeah, so the, the idea was to start with the Hippify tools. And if you, uh, if you clone the repo, Sorry, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about this since um, uh, Tom has already has already mentioned it. Uh, if you clone the repo and go on uh, uh, and and follow this link here, so Ghost Exchange Array Assign Hip Ver One CUDA, you basically can find uh, a version of this code that's using CUDA calls. So we're, we're assuming that your application is written in CUDA now and you want to uh, hippify it and then uh, run it on MD GPUs and, and optimize and profile. So if you clone this, you can do just as uh, what Tom said, you can do a hippify Perl and pipe to a new, uh, a new uh, code and that will be, will be uh, having hip calls. Uh, so the next thing is, uh, well, what if, the code that I'm working on now that has been hippified uh, actually has, you know, some some error uh, in terms of it's running, it's completing, uh, but it's not doing what I would like it to do. And in, in my opinion, I used to be at Los Alamos lab before developing applications. Um, these types of errors are the ones that are harder to find because it's it's not clear what the error is. You're, you're not getting an error message. It's just looking at the solution and it's not what you would like it to be. Um, so I, I wanted to show you briefly how we can use RockGDB to, to tackle this type of situation. Um, so RockGDB is uh, the AMD Rockham source level debugger uh, for Linux, and it comes with the Rockham stack uh, also in the later versions of, of Rockham. So if you install Rockham, then you also have uh, RockGDB. So uh, let's see how we can use it to, to play around and, and actually fix uh, a, a bug. So uh, if, you, if you look at uh, this link here, this, this code in the repo, there's a, a directory that's called ver1 with bug. So basically I have introduced the bug uh, in, in ver1, which is not gonna produce any compiler runtime error. It's just gonna produce a solution that's incorrect. So let's see how we can how we can fix that. Um, so you know here is just like uh, the recipe that you need to build and and compile. And since we are debugging, let's consider a problem size that's that's small. So basically, uh, dash i and dash j will determine the problem size, uh, and dex, uh, dash x and dex, dash y will decide. Uh, the MPI partitioning of your domain. So basically we're running with four processes. Uh, dash X4 and dash Y1 mean that your domain will be partitioned with four uh, vertical strips. So, um, so we see from this output that, um, you know, this, this assumes that we already know how it should look like based on the fact that we are we know what we are initializing our solution uh, to be. Um, so as I said, these are the four uh, st vertical strips uh, for each process. And um, looking at, for instance, the first process, process zero, we would like the solution to look like that. So 400.3.2.1 and 0. 
though we see that instead uh, we have some fives. So what else can we um, gather from this little, little picture here is that basically um, you see at the top picture, the numbers that are um, inside the, the uh, blue uh, rectangle, those are the cells that are owned by each process. And those around are the ones that are the ghost cells. So are, well, either boundary cells or, or ghost cells. So for instance, um, the ones that are here to the right of the uh, rectangle for process zero, those are halo cells owned by process one. So the fact that we have fives on the on the own cells uh, tells us that this is not a problem for uh, related to parallelism and pi parallelism. This is just that the values are not initialized correctly. So what we can do now is we can use rock GDB and, and try to understand where exactly the problem is. Um, so you can uh, use this dash TUI option for rock GDB that is gonna open a, a GUI, a graphics uh, user interface on your terminal. So at the top, you will have uh, the GUI and at the bottom, you will have the, the command line. To place breakpoints, you just need to do B and then the line number where you'd like to place the breakpoints. So right now uh, with 188 and 197, we are uh, placing breakpoints uh, basically right after the, the kernels that are initializing our solution. And to see uh, what breakpoints you have set, you can just do I and then B. Uh, and that actually will not show you the breakpoints by line number, but by ID, basically, something that's called num. So in case you want to delete a breakpoint, you don't have to do D and then the line number at which you set it. You just have to do D and then uh, the, the ID of the breakpoint that you can get by doing I and then B. So R will run your application, and we'll just step to the next slide and see we'll continue. Um, so uh, something that's uh, interesting about RockGDB is that it, it allows you to print uh, the value of arrays that exist on device, but from the host. So if you do uh, P and then the array, uh, it, it will tell you actually the value, the value of that. So we can keep track of where um, our solution X changes as we execute the program, um, or actually we, we can keep track uh, of when it does not change because the five is basically a value that we initialize uh, the solution to, and then we need to change it to 400. Uh, and it, that change doesn't happen here. So we wanna keep track of um, where it doesn't change when, when it should be. Um, yeah, so basically uh, if we print the solution, we see that the solution has not uh, changed uh, after after some uh, some kernel calls such as this one here uh, in init core two, uh, so what what happens into this init core two? Basically, uh, as Tom showed you before, we are querying the thread read information to get this TID uh, X and TID Y that we are then using uh, to access the entries of our solution X and then uh, set some, some value to those entries. Um, so the problem is that um, some of those entries of X are not touched by this, uh, this writing here, this uh, sign. And, and that's because uh, basically we don't have enough threads to actually uh, access all the entries that we need to, to change uh, for, for our solution. And we can see that with RockGDB because if we set a breakpoint directly inside the kernel in it core two at line 22, and then do an I dispatches, we can actually visualize the thread grid uh, on RockGDB that's been used for that specific kernel. So this is the output from the terminal. Um, and we see that uh, in the Y direction of the grid, we only have two threads which means that basically that TIDY only has zero and one values, which is not gonna be enough to actually access all the entries that we need to overwrite on, on the array X. So, so yeah, so 
this uh, was the the bug. <laughs> uh, the bug was that we did not have enough threads in the in the y direction. So to fix it, we just need to increase uh, the thread size uh, for for the block um, on the y direction. Okay. So the next thing is we found the error. Now it's doing what we uh, what we wanted to do, but it's slow. So how how do we make it faster? Well, the first thing that we can do is we can use Rockprof, which also comes with uh, the Rockham stack and it's the, the profiler. Uh, and we can use it to do a quick scan of what kernels are actually uh, making our application run slow. So basically, we need to find those kernels that take the most time uh, to, co to complete uh, during the execution. Um, Yes, so uh, we can do that by um, going to version one in the in the code, which is the one without the bug. <laughs> uh, and then we can run rockprof like this. So rockprof dash dash stats. Um, and that will show us uh, basically what are the kernels that we are running in our application, uh, how much time each one takes, and what percentage of, of the overall time uh, each kernel is taking. And if you don't like this uh, uh, view, you can always open it in a, in a spreadsheet and it's gonna look better as, as the bottom panel here. So we see that uh, the, the kernel that takes the most time is what's called blur, which is the five point stencil kernel. And it makes sense since it's, it's the one that's doing the computation. Uh, and then there's the, the init core, uh, which is the kernel that was setting um, the solution values to five, say, or six or seven. And init core two is the one that had the bug that we have fixed. So blur and init core are the ones that are taking the most time. Um, and with rock props, you, you can focus on different things. You can look at uh, HSA trace, uh, hip trace, or, or a mix, of, not, not a mix, or, or, or both, uh, depending on what you uh, specify uh, as input flags. Uh, so if you, for instance, uh, run with a dash dash hit trace, um, you're going to get a JSON file that you can open uh, on Profeto, which is uh, a user interface uh, in Chrome. So you can just uh, open your Chrome browser and go to Profeto. You don't need to be online for that. And then open the JSON file and you will be able to see the traces. So we, we turn hit traces on so you can track the uh, hip calls over here, such as hip device synchronize. And also you'll be able to see the kernel calls such as blur and, and something that's uh, enforcing the boundary conditions. Um, if you click on the, on the specific uh, item that you're interested in, you can see more information su such as specifically uh, what the duration is. Uh, and that's, that's what's circled over here. Uh, yeah, Rockprof has several other tools that I'm not going to touch on over here. Uh, one that is probably worth mentioning is the uh, RockTX markers that basically allow you to uh, include user-defined markers in your code so that when you open the trace up on Perfetto, you can actually see uh, <laughs> new rectangles that correspond to uh, what you had introduced with uh, RockTX. Okay, so the next thing is, this is an MPI application. We wanna learn more about what's happening with MPI. And for that, we cannot use RockProf, uh, but we need to use uh, OmniTrace. So OmniTrace provides a more holistic view of what's happening in your application. And it can track MPI, PAPI, Cocos, and, and you know uh, other, other activity in your application. Um, and uh, the, the files that will be generated by Omnitrace are not JSON, they're called Proto, but you can still open them up on, on Profeto. Um, so, yeah, so basically uh, on this slide, there's just uh, the, the commands to actually uh, instrument, instrument your, your binary and then use Omnitrace to, to get information on, on what's happening. Uh, and this is just the, the logo that shows up when you when you run it, uh, when you use OmniTrace Run, and it's it's helpful to take a look at it just to make sure that 
you are running the OmniTrace version that you that you want uh, with the Rockham version uh, that you want. So just be aware that this will, will give you that information. Uh, so once again on Perfetto, you'll be able to see uh, your 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 traces, and in particular now I'm highlighting the the MPI related ones. And in, instead of just um, clicking on it and looking at the screen at the bottom, if you click on the uh, the rectangle and press M, the duration will, M as in Michael, the duration will appear uh, directly above it. So, so that's helpful. And you can also basically use the, uh, the pointer, the mouse, to uh, select rectangles, uh, like areas around your traces, and that will show you uh, for that specific selection what the duration is. So something that's uh, interesting, and, and Tom also mentioned it before, is that you can overlap uh, GPU computation with CPU activity. And if you're interested in that, uh, in the exercises repo, there's, there's an example that's does, that does that. And you can check that, and you can see that with Omnitrace. Um, so this is uh, a screenshot of what, what happens uh, in that case. And you can see that uh, blur is the kernel that's uh, overlapping with the MPI activity that's happening on the CPU. Um, and this could be very beneficial for you know, porting because if you, if you have just your CPU code, you can um, start in, a, uh, in an incremental way with the porting just by selecting the the loops that are most expensive and then just translating those to, to GPU kernels. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it will is, is the process of, of porting. And whenever uh, you are working on the MI300A architecture, um, you can get even more benefit from this overlapping because you don't need to um, do any memory exchange um, between CPU and GPU, since MI300A has um, it, it, the same storage space for CPU and GPU. And so leveraging that, uh, this overlapping can be uh, even more beneficial than on a discrete GPU. Uh, this is just an example of what uh, an Omnitrace config file looks like. You can specify different things, uh, different type of activity, HSA, or even HIP uh, that's not here. Uh, you can simplify your traces by setting sampling GPUs and CPUs to zero, so you'll get less information. Um, and you know, there's many, many others that you could play with. And if you're interested, there is uh, a, a new talk that um, a member of our team did for for Oak Ridge. You can find it here, and that's just on only trace, so it's gonna go a lot in a lot more detail uh, than what you're seeing here. Okay, so the next thing is um, our code is running. We found the hotspots. We understand a lot uh, <laughs> about what's happening behind the scenes with MPI, possibly other other um, other instances that we're interested in, such as Cocos. But now we want to take a kernel and make sure that that specific kernel is performing and it's not slowing down uh, our application. So for that, for specific kernel improvement, uh, we have got uh, OmniPerf. So let's let's take a look at what we can get from OmniPerf, and this is just you know a glance because there's just so much so much more that you can do. Uh, so first thing is we can uh, get roof lines. So this is just a little cartoon that shows um, what a roof line is. Basically, um, you see this blue line here is the bandwidth bound, and the green one is the compute bound. And your kernel, uh, which is the, this uh, dot in, in the picture, the, the gray dot, will sit somewhere be, uh, between the right of the bandwidth bound line and the bottom of the compute bound. And ideally, you would like your, your data point uh, for your kernel performance to move up and, and to the right. Um, so if, if the point is very close to the bandwidth bound line, it means that the kernel is bandwidth bound. If it's close to the compute bound, it means that it's compute bound. 
Uh, and you can get uh, this type of plot from, from OmniPerf. So uh, you would load the module and then use OmniPerf profile uh, with uh, dash dash roof line, uh, sorry, roof only. And this is the, the roof line for, for our application. So Blur and init Core are the two ones that were uh, most expensive as we've seen in RockProf. And this is where they, they sit. Um, yeah, so the next thing is, okay, so Blur and init Core 2 are the most expensive, in particular Blur, because it's the one that was advancing the solution and taking over 90% of the time. So what can we do to, to improve it? But, but also, what can we do to actually assess that what we've done was indeed an improvement? Uh, because you know we can always do things, <laughs> but we we want those changes to be effective. Um, so for for this task, we're gonna use OmniPerf uh, profile. So basically, what I'm gonna show you is that we're gonna run the the code just as is and call it v1. Uh, this dash n here is giving a name to the, to the data. Um, so we're we're just running the code as is. And we can uh, use this OmniPerf analyze to, to list the kernel IDs for each kernel that, we, that we're interested in. Uh, for instance, blur as kernel ID zero. Uh, we can also use that same command to get the dispatch IDs. So the dispatch IDs are basically the IDs associated, associated to each uh, kernel launch. Uh, so for instance, blur is gonna have seven, which is the first uh, launch, then 12, 17, and 22. So we're gonna be using that information next um, to dive a little bit deeper. So uh, so the next thing is we wanna make a change to, to our, to our uh, kernels and see if those changes actually uh, make the application go faster. So uh, this little change here, basically it's, uh, it's uh, reducing the grid size. Yeah, don't get fooled by the fact that there's a larger number. It, it's actually reducing the grid size. Um, and, and this grid size is actually what's used uh, by both uh, the blur and the init core uh, kernels. So after this change, we're going to compile our code again and, and run OmniPerf profile calling the data uh, v2. So now we have data sitting in two folders, two directories, workloads v1 and workloads v2. And with OmniPerf Analyze, we're gonna be comparing head to head the performance of uh, v1 with v2. And you can specify what information you're interested in with this uh, dash dash block. So for instance, 16.3 uh, will give you information about uh, latency. And if, if we specifically look at L1 access latency, we see that going from uh, V1 to V2, there's actually a lot of improvement. So basically the latency goes down uh, by, um, so, th so this, uh, sorry if it's not showing, but what's over here is the, the average and what's to the right is the maximum. So on average goes down by uh, 84%. And that actually, even though I'm not showing it here, it resulted in, uh, I think, around um, 4x uh, speed up. Um, so if, if you're interested in a specific dispatch uh, of, of your blur kernel, you can um, select from the table that I showed you before, such as, for instance, number two, which is the second dispatch of the kernel. Um, and here I'm printing information, uh, even though I'm not showing it, I apologize. I'm printing information on the grid size, uh, work group size, and, and wavefronts. And if you, if you had that output, you would see that um, the block size hasn't changed, but the grid size going from V1 to V2 has decreased. And this dispatch call here just shows you one instance of uh, the difference in kernel launch time and you can see that going from V1 to V2, there was a speed up of uh, a reduction in the time of around 74%. Uh, so 
Yeah, so this is just like a tiny, tiny uh, example of what you can do with OmniPerf. And I recommend you check out uh, this presentation that was done um, at HLRS last April that's just on OmniPerf. And we'll show you in a lot more detail um, something more uh, compared to what I talked about. So, so yeah, this is all. Thank you very much for, for having me and for your attention.